This one happened to have been set up by an act of uh, parliament. So most people are not too com comfortable with referring to the ADI because they feel probably they would be more skewed towards the states. So they often regard it as more of part of the legal system, you know. But I would say that is not true considering the uh, tall list of distinguished experts uh, over there who have registered as, as uh, arbitration experts. Now we then moved on, our fourth um, section then moved on to the international obligations. Uh, Ghana is not an island. Uh, we live within an international community. So we have international obligations. We signed mm -hmm. several international agreements. And with that uh, comes our obligations to resolve disputes on the international platform. So most often than not, if you look at um, uh, upstream contracts, um, often than not arbitration is done either under the exit Citra Ohada. Now, thankfully, we have the EFT uh, as well. Now, one of the speakers also referred to the fact that we have numerous arbitration centers on the uh, African continent. So we have enough to resolve our arbitration. We then ended it with our conclusion and then gave a recommendation. Now, um, there's a tall list of recommendation, but the most important one I'll say is that, yes, we have the arbitration center, although it was set up by an act of parliament, it does not necessarily mean that it's a state uh, entity because most of those who are registered as um, the experts are nowhere connected to the state. So I would urge a lot of us uh, to actually, when we are negotiating for these um, energy contracts to um, use the center, the ADR center to resolve our energy disputes. Thank you very much, Karen. I hope I was within time. <laughs> Yes, you are. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll quickly move to Mr. Patson Arinaitwe. Uh, Patson is a partner at Signum Advocates, one of the leading law firms best in Kampala. And he's a UK and Ugandan trained lawyer with 15 years experience in dispute resolution and infrastructure project practice. Uh, his chapter is on energy disputes and arbitration in Uganda. Um, and so would you give us a brief summary of your chapter and what key highlights you would want us to take away from this conference and as far as energy disputes and arbitration in Uganda? Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, and I would like to add my voice to, to the rest of the team on thanking Dr. Narire and the rest of the team for organizing this quite timely and very relevant um, uh, to what is happening on the continent. And regarding the, my topic, um, I know I have less time, so I'll try to have a uh, you know, high-level summary. And, and I must first mention that um, for those of you who have not visited Uganda, it's one of the be most beautiful countries on the, not only on the continent, but also you know, globally, um, blessed with uh, very good wildlife and um, natural resources. And we can't talk about uh, energy without actually making reference to, to the natural resources. Uh, that we have in Uganda. Uh, our energy mix has uh, almost 95% uh, you know, renewable. Uh, so far, Uganda is generating over 2,000 you know, megawatts of electricity. Half of that is from hydro. And we've had quite successful projects in Bujagari, in, in Karuma, and the rest, uh, which are very important as far as um, energy security in, in Uganda is concerned. Um, and for the last 10 years, we have also seen infrastructure development in as far as petroleum uh, sector is concerned with a, the East African pipeline project that has been controversial, uh, subject of litigation, especially in, um, in Paris in relation to uh, project affected areas. So when you look at what is happening in Uganda, especially for the last uh, 10 years, uh, you will see you know, massive infrastructure development but, so, but also you have over 40 uh, generation projects spun across uh, different parts of the country. Uh, and we're talking about only renewable energy. And, and in the last 10 years, we've also seen over 13 oil and gas fields that are licensed. Uh, meaning that in terms of the infrastructure development in the energy space, a lot is happening. And, and beyond that, We've also seen these projects being uh, uh, situated in uh, heavy uh, settled areas. They are also uh, situated in over 60 protected areas, uh, the UNESCO uh, World Heritage Sites, and that creates some of the environmental protection issues uh, that we've seen for the last um, you know, five years. 
So the disputes we've seen so far, you, you have uh, disputes relating to environmental protection. Uh, you have disputes that have involved you know, local communities. I think a case in, in, in point when they were developing the Bujagari energy, which over 250 megawatts. Uh, we saw the community coming up against uh, some of the sponsors of the project. And IFC had to mediate over that you know, dispute with the local communities and over 500 people were settled. And we've also seen disputes emanating from uh, uh, local communities with um, Albert and Graben where the oil and gas exploration activities are happening. Those have also been mediated with also you know, government involved in ensuring that um, they don't escalate into you know, brown conflict with um, you know, operators. Besides the, the local communities, we've also had a fair share of disputes uh, relating to the project documents. I think the, the most notorious one is with the operators and, and DURA, which was a tax dispute uh, resolved under um, the LCI framework. Uh, we've also seen quite a number of uh, shareholder disputes involving uh, project costs, uh, involving uh, calculation of um, evacuation losses that have also been part of uh, IC, ICC arbitration as well as um, uh, LCIA. So from the arbitration perspective, we see quite a lot of um, you know, development. I know that uh, especially in the renewable energy space, uh, Uganda developed you know, project documents, especially the power purchase arguments, the implementation arguments uh, under the GetFit program, um, which was able to standardize, for instance, uh, dispute resolution clauses. You won't see any agreement in the space in Uganda without, for instance, a, a, either expert determination as well as arbitration as part of um, uh, the dispute resolution uh, mechanism. And we've seen growth of preference for London, Paris, and uh, Mauritius as uh, you know destination for these um, arbitrations, which is not only encouraging but also discouraging from the continental point of view as uh, Africa-based you know, arbitrator and uh, arbitration practitioner. Um, and from the local scene, we have a model law which came into force in, uh, in 2000, the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. And since it came into force, we've also seen the growth of um, proactiveness from our courts to support arbitration. So chances are that when you have an arbitration clause, it will be um, implemented and courts will render support. And we've seen some cases being thrown out of court, especially where there's either an international arbitration framework or even ad hoc you know, arrangement in, in Uganda. Uh, but also under our, our power sector uh, legislation, there's a provision for uh, determination of disputes by electricity tribunal, especially where arbitration has not been preferred you know, by the parties or one of the affected person is not part of the project documents. So there's um, massive growth of, of uh, disputes in the electricity tribunal in Uganda, only to the extent that arbitration has not been you know, preferred by the parties. And um, that seems to be the trend in, in most of the project documents. Um, but also we've had a fair share in court, uh, especially where you have disputes relating to guarantees, performance guarantees, advance payment bonds that are in support of the energy projects. Uh, Insurance has not, in a way, embraced arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism, especially in the guarantees and, um, and bonds. So we see a lot of litigation arising out of that, but in the mainstream courts. Um, so in, in the grand scheme of things, you have uh, different segments of disputes with local communities that have been mediated upon, but also settled in the, in the court system, but also heavy support both local and international for arbitration where uh, parties have, have preferred such. And there's a lot of streamlining in, in Uganda in as far as arbitration is concerned. Uh, but I also know that where government is involved, there's a preference for particular seats. You will see a lot of ICC, uh, LCIA and Mauritius frameworks uh, to support the, you know, the process. I hope that gives you know, the, the general you know, picture of the disputes in Uganda. I'll be happy to take on you know, any questions. Um, thank you, Patton. Thank you so much for that. Uh, next, we will have Madeline Kimei. 
Uh, Madeline Kime is the founder and principal director of iResolve, which is a fully fledged arbitration uh, ADR and corporate, corporate law practice that's based in Tanzania. Um, Madeline's chapter is on mining disputes and international arbitration in Tanzania. Uh, Madeline, would you give us a few brief highlights on your chapter? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And um, once again, thank you to uh, NEM Conference for um, organizing such a, a wonderful gathering of minds um, to speak about what is um, currently happening in the mining sector and what we perceive uh, would happen in the near future. Now, my chapter, as you have rightly uh, pointed out, focuses on the mining industry disputes um, that arise from that from an international concept, con context. Um, much of Tanzania's wealth um, is on the ground. And so the chapter really starts off by um, touching on how this sector has recorded um, quite a, a massive uh, turnaround over the, the past couple of years. Um, meaning that we have seen uh, over 500 active licenses being put in operation in, in over 40 types of minerals in the country. So with all this activity and, um, and more so being enticed by the current shift in embracing and trying to attract more investors, we are seeing that every company would have that sharp eye on the risks um, which would probably uh, trickle down to their operations and expose them to um, a potential uh, disputes that would um, require a, a dispute resolution mechanism such as arbitration. Now, the chapter initial, initially starts off with a little bit of history, a little bit of background on how this mining sector has developed over the years. We touch on sorry, I touch on the 1920s to the 30s, where we had the colonial era and the, and the findings of diamonds and the likes, and then the shift towards the privatization in the, in the, in the, uh, around the 90s, where we saw there was much more um, mining sector activity and restructuring of that program. And then in 2008, where um, it, it really was flourishing and opening up even more with the introduction of one of those, uh, two of the biggest mines to date, the Hulu uh, mine and the Gator Gold mine. And so that's really where we start off um, in the chapter. I then uh, take on the um, 2009 mineral policy. Why I touch on this is because of these um, comments that came from a report dating in 2002 um, called, or we target the Bomani report um, that advised the government on the mining sector oversight. And this is really um, where it all began, where I'm about to get to in terms of the changes that happened to the mining legislation between 2017 and 2018. I hope I'm still within time. And during this 2017, uh, 2018 period, there were vigorous changes to the Mining Act. Um, and the argument is, is that the Bomani report had made certain recommendations that were not uh, taken into account in the legislation that was dating 2010. And so in 2017, when the, uh, when the phase Magufuli uh, was, 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 was spearheading came into play, they wanted to make sure that what was recommended in that Bomani report was implemented into law. And so therefore we saw this negative um, or a negative move towards um, the removal of the retention licenses from the legislation. So the legislation had specific sections and that was section 16 uh, that was then amended um, by, uh, an, uh, by section 16 of the written laws miscellaneous amendment of 2017 repealing the relevant sections within the Mining Act um, uh, of 2010, section 37 and 38, um, and removing entirely this portion of retention licenses. Um, as a result of that repeal, um, the newly formed Mining Commission then announced that they were uh, officially or uh, statutorily canceling the 11 retention licenses that were effective as of that date of May, 2018. 
And so in exercising these powers, uh, they utilized Regulation 21 uh, of the Mining Minerals Rights Regulations 2018, which the chapter also looks into so that we can get um, uh, an understanding of where the, the, the government was coming from. Along with these changes to the Mining Act um, of 2010, um, we had we saw just right after uh, and under a certificate of urgency, um, just as the Mining Act Amendment was, a new legislative piece called the Natural Wealth and Resource Resources Permanent Sovereignty Act, or I refer to as the so sovereign uh, as the Permanent Sovereignty Act. This act then required. Um, that, among other things, parliamentary approvals for all investor state agreements, which must be fully secured with the interest of Tanzanians in mind, a very welcome approach. Then the Sovereignty Act also then required all agreements to apply Tanzanian law. This is the, the, the protectionist um, nationalist approach that we heard come from most of the speakers uh, today. But of interest of this on this chapter would be section 11 of that permanent sovereignty act 2017 which prohibits proceedings in foreign courts or tribunals uh, and so it abolishes the isds system for purposes of resolving disputes arising from the mining and extractive sector now this came as a shock to the investors because we are part of two international treaties we're also not a closed Island. So we have regional treaties, we have the BITs, the multilateral agreements, such as the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, MEGA, and, and the likes. And so this did come as a, 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 a thinking by the investors that it was a, a violation of the rights that accrue from those. Uh, and so the Permanent Sovereignty Act is discussed at length, and we share our thoughts on what the problem problems that have arisen from that, including the interpretation of this particular section 11, where it um, used the word established, that the entity that would resolve, whether it be the tribunal uh, or a court, must be established in Tanzania. This really created um, a reaction no one has ever seen before, because uh, what was understood by that was that not only the, the governing law being Tanzanian law, but the seat of arbitration would also have to be Tanzanian uh, a seat, and the institution would also be a Tanzanian established um, and recognized entity, which was very problematic on a practical um, aspect. As we heard from Mercy, the infrastructure, the ability to be able to, to accommodate in terms of access infrastructure of institutions was yet to be given its teeth at that time. Then the chapter goes on to speak of the Unconscionable Terms Act. This also came in the same year, 2017, and the Unconscionable Terms Act really, act really what it says is that, um, the government may unilaterally terminate arrangements which they see, uh, which would be seen to be unconscionable. And unconscionable itself is being defined in that. Um, but in, of course, in practice, we've not seen any, um, any uh, precedents come out from the courts, but we do understand that it has a higher threshold um, in terms of uh, um, ascertaining as opposed to unfair. Uh, the word unfair, using the word unfair, that is much more um, understood. And so the, the word unconscionable itself really did create uncertainty. The investors were pretty much um, tied to a corner here when it comes to this. And, and I recall during that time, the Tanzania Chamber of Mines wanted a presentation on how best they would be able to uh, resolve their disputes uh, in, in light of these legislative pieces that had come into play during that time. And we made presentations, of course, at that time, not having the Arbitration Act in place. Now, before I get to the Arbitration Act itself, I wanted to also um, state that the chapter will touch a, a little bit on the private, um, Public-Private Partnership Act. Uh, the amendments that happened in 2018 also introduced this, um, this uh, aspect of any dispute arising during the course of any agreement with regards to the PPP uh, would be resolved through negotiations 
or arbitration be adjudicated by judicial bodies or other organs established in the United Republic and in accordance with the laws of Tanzania. So even the PPP Act was amended to implement the same approach of um, withdrawing from the ISDS system. And we do understand from the, uh, that there are certain concession agreements and arrangements uh, that are PPP uh, structured, such as the, um, the outcome from the Barrick um, uh, settlement negotiations with the government, where they created a joint venture company called Twigger Minerals. This is a joint venture. Apologies, um, a joint ventures and other efforts such as the government entering into partnership with the nickel company for purposes of nickel mining. And so they will be affected even through this particular act or enactment. I, I hope I have another minute just to conclude with my conclusions. Um, I yes, did please. to also say that the chapter will touch on the Arbitration Act. I would not do it justice if I don't. There are certain provisions that came through the Arbitration Act as miscellaneous or consequential miscellaneous changes to those en enactments of uh, Permanent Sovereignty and Unconscionable Terms Act. And so, you know, when you're trying to look through the law, you really did, do need to know where to find them. And so the revised edition of the Arbitration Act came about to then remove the word established from that sentence, meaning that, okay, the seat can be anywhere, you can choose any arbitration institution of choice, but the law would still be Tanzanian law in terms of a dispute that comes out of um, extractive sectors. Um, and so, yes, we'll touch on the issue of seat and the issues of interpretation that arose during that time and what is happening now. What we're seeing now, and Karen, if you'd allow me to conclude, uh, what we're seeing now is a much more um, enabling government where we're now reviewing these laws. We're looking at where we can um, amend to ensure that the investor has avenues that are independent and neutral from the host state. And so that is efforts being made by the current government and we are anticipating uh, much, much more work to be done and in, in, in future um, legislative reforms to, um, to, to not only uh, balance the scale in terms of uh, the approach uh, that was taken previously, but also uh, create even better policies around dispute resolution in the extractive se uh, sector. Um, one such suggestion, of course, after seeing the cases that are at the ITSID that are still pending, so we're going to try in the chapter, if something comes out from the ITSID tribunal, such as the Windshear case that is ongoing, they've just conducted the hearing, it's online. Um, the Windshear Gold case is to do with those retention licenses that were revoked. They had four retention licenses, and we'll give this example in that chapter. We have the um, Montero case that is also pending at the ITSID. Um, we do not have an outcome of that. It's still very much at its infancy, along with the Nachinguea um, uh, ITSID um, case that is currently pending and was triggered under the BIT with the UK, while the Montero and Windshear were triggered under the BIT with Canada. And so that's very interesting to watch out for the chapter. If we do get the content out by then, we would be able to cover then what the tribunal see, whether the country acted by direct expropriating those retention licenses or not. And so that's the argument being put forward um, by the parties in those um, arbitral proceedings. And to conclude, we do certain recommendations such as the new Tanzania Investment Act that came into play this year. Uh, in, 20, in 2023, this act, yes, adopts the same model. However, um, because it adopts the same model, there is still ambiguities um, to it in, in terms of addressing concerns of investors and dispute resolution. And I heard from my Ghanaian colleague, uh, Dr. Francesca, about how the Ghanaians do it. And so here, what we've proposed and, um, is that there should be a holistic and hands-on approach. Tanzania should include some sort of a dispute prevention management of, um, uh, system where um, we can borrow leave from the Brazilians and the Koreans so that at the very primary level of the dispute, there is an avenue for parties to feel safe in, in terms of how they can resolve that dispute and um, embracing the investor state mediation um, mechanism, uh, which is the new baby uh, in the ISDS uh, system. And so these are the kind of proposals um, that are put forward for formulating an ADR policy that would 
uh, take into account the nationalization approach, the protectionist approach, and uh, to be more specific to the extractive sector. Thank you, Karen. I hope I'm not way over time. Thank no, you. no, you're not. Thank you so much. Um, our last speaker on this panel session is Sarah Fafa. Um, I hope she is available. Available. Hi, I am available. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Um, I saved Sarah last because she comes from a unique background. She's a chief state attorney, uh, director legal ministry of energy for the Republic of Ghana. And we've had from a lot of people in private practice and people in academia. And I thought I would save her for last to help us sum up this session from a unique perspective, a unique angle of hearing from someone who works directly within the government to just throw more light on, to just briefly throw light on how they perceive uh, disputes and arbitration is specifically in her area of expertise, which is oil and gas disputes in Ghana. Hi, good afternoon and many thanks to Dr. Victoria. Uh, most of the things I wanted to talk about have been talked about by uh, Dr. Franka. I wanted to talk about the court system and the way it works in Ghana. So what I would do is I would directly deal with um, some of the arbitration cases that the ministry or the government is saddled with. Um, one would say, where is this dispute arising from? Um, everyone knows that Ghana discovered oil early part of the 20 um, year 2000. And at the time we didn't have that much regulations. We had a GNPC, which was the National Oil Company. At the time we didn't have a regulator that is a petroleum commission and also other legislation. So um, some PPAs were signed and you know when you're signing this agreement, one of the things that government is settled with is that when you go to the negotiation table, the uh, what do you take to the table? The leverage, you don't have that equal bargaining power. So government gave quite a lot of, uh, a lot away in terms of um, the almighty monster we see in agreement all the time, that is stabilization clauses. So um, Dr. Franca mentioned some few energy cases that were local in the Ghanaian courts that happened and some that is in, in international arbitration. Um, one of the cases we have dealt with, he mentioned GPGC, which was a wrongful termination of uh, an emergency uh, power agreement. We also have the petroleum um, agreement um, arbitration where that bottles line on the uh, stabilization. Because governments have the prerogative of passing new laws and new legislations, wherever it passes a new legislation, it triggers um, certain arbitration clauses. And one typical one is in the area of tax. We've had two tax arbitration, actually three tax arbitrations, that has been said on us due to um, a change in um, the tax regime. Um, what the measures that we have taken uh, from a government perspective is to move more per se from having strict stabilization clauses to more economic equilibrium clauses in the agreement. Also, um, one of the things is that having a petroleum model agreement and also skewing it towards each and every international arbitration because we had a model petroleum agreement. But when you look at the agreement that has been signed in the past, no particular PA is the same. So what we have done last year and this year is revising our petroleum um, uh, module, the module agreement. Um, we've had some sort of consultations um, this year already. Um, most also of our like decommission uh, unitization, we do not have um, reg regulations in the law, although we have the petroleum um, 
Exploration and Production Act. There are no the regulations to handle these uh, particular areas have not been put in place. So this year, for instance, one of the targets for the ministry is to have a decommission regulation, is to have a unitization issue. Oh. One of the cases that we have in court that uh, we have in arbitration that um, we're going to be handling is a unitization. Um, and it borders down on interpretation. One, the minister has given a directive for something to be done. The IOCs argue that the interpretation of the law, it's not what the minister had adhered to. So my take and the peculiarness of where we sit is one, I heard from um, Ms. Sokoko that it's preparation of drafting of the agreement and then also the negotiation. We have to have very comprehensive uh, drafting that can handle all the nitty gritty things that sometimes you don't foresee these things. But if the drafting of these agreements can handle some of these issues, when we discovered oil, of course, we, 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 we didn't know some of the um, issues that would arise in, 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 in this going forward. So for, Unitization policies that we are putting in place. We've had the help of the um, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. Um, we've had a lot of consultations with them. They have shared their experience with us. We've had templates being shared with us. And we've also had um, many uh, country um, experience that have come to speak to the ministry. So we're trying to put these things in place and also enact them in the regulations. So at least we have that template where we don't cherry pick from um, policies because when we cherry pick from policies where it's not really entrenched in law, that's also results in a lot of uh, a dispute arising. What are some of the um, solutions that government government in? It's putting in place, especially with the energy sector. We quite we had a we paid quite a huge sum last year, like uh, Doctor uh, Franca mentioned to GPGC. So, with the petroleum, the PPAs as well, there has been the revision of the models that we had. We had something called take or pay that we have a new policy now that government is not entering into a take or pay policy anymore. Um, one of the issues is that whether the, if you move from take or pay, whether it will be a bankable um, um, project. But um, we, we, we are trying very hard to have those sort of templates so that when we meet with other um, companies or international companies, government will have some sort of a strong position to negotiate from. One of the issues also is that um, it's capacity building. Um, some of the areas are very, very, I mean, we have lawyers and some of the areas are very, very technical. So one of the things that the ministry have taken initiative is to really um, educate um, our personnel, our legal counsels in these areas. For example, I came into arbitration quite long ago, but I found it very interesting. I've uh, um, done a lot of trainings have been, people have been kind enough like Dr. Victoria to let me participate and, and I've met very good friends who shared knowledge because I realized that is the knowledge sharing that goes around. I mean, if a country, if I haven't done something in my country is coming onto this particular programs like this that you take back to the table, the drawing table when you have maybe a cabinet invite you to come and do a presentation or you invite it into, you take a, a policy to, you can use the country specific examples to push your agenda because one of the things when you take, uh, you want to enact or do a legislation, you have a stakeholder meeting and you have to have a justification. Most of the times when you don't have the background or you don't have the technical know-how, it's very difficult to convince cabinet or convince parliamentarians as to why you feel that such a thing should be included in your law to participate with. But we also have, um, 
five very good uh, Estena councils that we are, we are learning from, um, the councils that we are handling our cases, kind enough to also have um, some sort of uh, virtual uh, trainings and virtual workshops with us. They fly down to Ghana to kind of like teach us how, how to handle these things. So um, we are getting there. And I think that um, um, Dr. Um, Prof also talked about uh, diversity as to what we bring onto the table. I think that when you go onto the table that you understand all the things that are in the agreement, it kind of like give you some sort of leverage in, um, in, in handling this, tackling these things. One of the issues that um, I feel we as a ministry government is very peculiar that we need, we need help from. Um, we have the Attorney General unit and basically in Ghana, um, or do I sit in the Ministry of Energy as a state attorney? It is the uh, Attorney General that handles all the cases on behalf of government. So if, let's say, an arbitration is served on me, I will forward all the documentation to the Attorney General to handle it. But one of the things we are doing now is to collaborate with these uh, uh, all the lawyers um, in the state agencies um, to do capacity building, to learn and to also have the technical know-how in there because energy background is very peculiar. Now we're moving into uh, energy transition and that we also anticipate that because we're moving into energy transition, we have some of um, COP and we've made commitment. There will be new legislation that are coming up that might trigger certain stabilization clauses as well. So I think one that will be very key for government lawyers is to have the capacity building to be knowledgeable at birth of what is happening in the sector and then also to be able to handle these things when they arise. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was extremely insightful. Um, thank you all to the panelists and for attending this session. Um, I will hand back to Dr. Victoria. All right, uh, thanks. thanks a lot, Karen, and thanks to the panelists and the participants with this has been a very long session. I, I noticed we started when we were like 70, to 80, and now we're 50 people. But again, I thank you for staying with us. And I know very many people registered for this conference, over 300 people, but I think because it's online, there are always issues with online things. But the good thing, uh, it's live on YouTube. So I'll be able to share the video and the material to the, all the people who registered. I still have three questions. Uh, Cynthia or Karen, do you think anyone from your panel can be able to address them? And uh, in the meantime, as you're deciding who can address the three questions we have, I would like to hand over to Jocelyn and Kennedy to, I don't know if Jeffrey Ward is, is, is online. Jeff, are you online? He was supposed to talk about the book series for the Paul Grave. Jeff, are you online? All right, uh, I think he's not online. So we shall just proceed to the networking session. Uh, Cynthia or Karen, do you think you have anyone who can address the three questions we have in the Q&A? Cynthia, are you there? All right, uh, I'll hand over to Jocelyn so that we can do the networking session. So basically, we just want to encourage people to tell us where they are listening from their names. We have promoted you and granted you the right to speak, to be able to talk to us. So if we can moderate that, we'll be happy to hear from you. I see we have... Um, we have Evelyn, Maria, we have David. David, do you want to say hello? We have Elizabeth, Sobi, we have Ibrahim, we have Kate. I know Kate is from Kenya. Do you want to say hi and what you've learned from the session? We have Amara, Amara is into arbitration. So I'll start with Kate because her hand is up. 
Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So please allow me to um, not have my camera on. Yes. Um, but let me just say, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Victoria. I think we have uh, communicated quite a few times on, on uh, email. But from a point of view, you know, coming from academia uh, and from Kenya and coming from the Kenyan perspective, I just want to thank you for the book and thank you for this webinar. Uh, to be honest, I've been actually online since it began, since the very beginning, oh, yeah. because I cannot, I cannot seem to tear myself away. It's been so informative, and there's so quite a few, um, you know, like I said, points of synergy that I've taken note of that I look forward to engaging with the panelists and engaging with you and also Professor Damilola in terms of moving forward in the matter of international arbitration. So I'm very thankful and I'm very honored and great work, great, great work. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Jocelyn, do you see anyone else who's interested in talking? We can just moderate this together. I see Amara. Amara, you've also been online since the conference started. Do you want to say something? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amara and I'm joining from Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Thank you, Victoria, and your team for such a wonderful conference. I've been glued to my screen from start, and I must say, well done. You've done a lot. A very enlightening, very, very interesting session. And um, I hope to see more of this in years to come. Thank you so much. And thanks a lot for participating throughout. Thanks a lot. Joe, Joe Madawa, Madawa, do you want to say something? I also see Ibrahim. Uh, hi, Victoria. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm uh, Joe Mandawa. I am an LLM student at the University of Dundee. I've been following you on YouTube, Victoria. And when I registered, I found this very beneficial and uh, I'm kind of like considering and I'm going to write most of you to ask you for some guidance as I'm now much more interested in uh, arbitration dispute uh, resolution, how I would go, how I would go about it. Thank you very much. All right. And thanks a lot for joining us. I see Evelyn, Evelyn Maria. Jocelyn, please uh, join in. We, we need to. Or uh, Evelyn Maria, or anyone else who wants to say hello to us, the participants. And most of you uh, participated by using my name, Victoria Nolley. I think you, you forgot to put your names, and my name automatically came. So I can't be able to tell the names. I just say Victoria Nolley, Victoria Nolley. What about Rama? Rama. Ante. Okay, sis, say it. Kosolo. Kosolo. No, 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 don't I, mother my name. I can my also name see. <laughs> so, <laughs> my name is Sheye Kosoko from Lagos, Nigeria. And I'm very, very, very good here. I've been really, really learned a lot from the, I've been there since the beginning. And um, uh, Dami, I know, and um, it's a good book. And um, the area of speakers have been learned a lot. And um, it's, um, it's been time well spent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jocelyn, you are saying something? Uh, okay. I see Rama. Yes, Rama. Yes. Um, my name is Rama Inchi from Ghana. I'm, a, I'm an LLB student. Mm -hmm. And then I found their, product, their program very educative. So thank you so much. We want more of these. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot for staying with us. David, are you on? All right. I, I think that, oh, uh, okay. Who else? Yeah, I think that's it. And Hello. We shall... Good morning. Yes, please. Good morning. Good day, Victoria. Bertram Jackson from Abuja. Uh, thank you for this session. It has been quite informative. Actually, I'm focused on ESM, and this part is actually informative. I think I'll take more of the thoughts into whatever I'm writing going into the future. Thank you so much. 
Victoria. All right, and thanks to I, Otieno. I see your hand is up. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Victoria. I'm excited to have joined this session. I'm Mary Goretti from the University of Nairobi, a lecturer there. I got interested in knowing more about uh, mining and uh, the situation in Kenya is that women are at the lower end of mining. And for that matter, I'm excited to have this book launched and the book has been said to not to end, it is still open, more articles can be sent and I would wish to do something on women and mining in Kenya so that uh, you hear their experiences and the world get to know whether it is the same in other parts of the world. Thank you so much. This is great. Hello. Uh, yes, Hello. please. Yes, please. Hello, good afternoon. I'm joining from Cameroon. I Thank am uh, uh, so Sonan. Much. Yeah. Sonan Clovis Nonga. Um, uh, I've participated on some conferences, I think, since 2020 with uh, Victoria. And uh, it happens that uh, her area of interest, like energy law, arbitration, are some of those areas that I, I'm also interested. Uh, I've uh, been on the conference since 10 o'clock. It's been really informative and educative. Uh, we are from Cameroon. Uh, Cameroon is um, it's a country we don't have uh, development of arbitrary structures. I actually studied in Nigeria and I've been qualified in Nigeria and Cameroon as a lawyer. I actually did my thesis in LLM on comparing arbitration law in Cameroon and Nigeria. And I know Nigeria and other countries are very rich in it and I picked up an interest in arbitration. Um, the panelists have uh, educated us on it. My country is uh, situated in Central Africa between Nigeria, Congo, Chad, very rich resource countries. But my government has been very reticent in giving investment or signing treaties for exploration of contracts. And I think the future in respect of disputes, that one of the panelists said, uh, it's essentially disputes arise everywhere from planning, construction, uh, exploration, up to the level of the commission. I think I've learned a lot and I want to use this opportunity to thank uh, Victoria. You see, um, I sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge is very, very, very important. Organizing social conference, it means investing a lot. Not only it, one of the participants actually said you're very energetic and I admire that in you. Thank you a lot. And I think we could continue and uh, God bless you all. God bless you all, Africa from Cameroon. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I, I see another hand is up, but it has Victoria now. So maybe you can just unmute yourself and speak. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I am Elias Kazim. I've been on this call since morning also, and I've enjoyed the conversation so far. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Victoria Nanule and Professor Olawi for editing this uh, book. Uh, I'm a lawyer and arbitration practitioner from Nigeria, but currently I'm a PhD student in University of Aberdeen. I contributed a chapter to this book, and the title of the chapter is The Role of Arbitral Tribunal in Resolving Energy and Natural Resources Disputes in Africa. Uh, fitting in, into the conversation so far since money, my chapter looked into two broad ways in which arbitral tribunals uh, play a critical role in shaping best practices in arbitration in this uh, sector. And one of it uh, focused on the role of the tribunal to uh, the disputing parties in each individual um, cases, while the other one focused on the broader uh, jurisprudential impacts that the decisions in arbitral awards have in the on the sector. So in terms of the parties, I um, took the view that tribunals hold the parties in each case, the duty to resolve uh, a dispute with procedural efficiency and just determination of um, cases of which in terms of the procedural efficiency, I try to look at cost, um, duration and quality of decisions as well when in terms of the broader uh, impact that decisions of tribunals have on the sector, I uh, took the view that um, contributions of these awards 
uh, sink into a system where they help to shape best practices, as I've said earlier on. And that, that, that's sort of the summary of the contributions that the uh, chapter made. So far, I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, it all comes down to uh, the point that arbitration is thriving in Africa and is developing in a way that is very um, interesting, save for the fact that we still need to address issues like having to um, travel abroad to um, adjudicate cases through arbitration. I mean, the, the issue of having foreign seats, uh, it's a case that we, we have to continue to make that Africa must um, also be um, arbitral uh, seats okay. for cases involving African parties to enable practitioners play more critical role in developing the um, practice of arbitration in Africa, especially in the energy and natural resources sector. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot for that. And uh, thanks for contributing to the book. Uh, and now I'm speaking to Anya Kinsman, which is next to you. We shall be able to talk to you as a speaker. I see another hand, but it has Victoria Nalule. So maybe if you just unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Lorraine Dakwa, and I'm from Ghana. I'm with Dr. Franca in the University of Professional Studies. And I believe that she gave a very great presentation. So did all the others. And I think I've been particularly enlightened and interested in all that has been said. And I'm sure this will lead to more reading and learning. So kudos and we look forward to more. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. I think Friends, sorry, Dr. Victoria, I don't think your audio is being heard well. Okay, you can't hear me. Okay, now. Now, you can now, now, now it's 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 okay. All right, just like, do you think we have more people who would like to say hi before I invite uh, yes. Professor Damilola? Who else is there? Um, yes, yes. someone by the name Joanna Joanna uh, Baini. Uh. Yes. Hello. Um, Hello. Um, joining from Ghana. I'm currently a student at King University and high school. Even though I'm um, Madeline and Sarah, I've learned a lot, and I think more of these conferences. Yeah. Thank you so much. Picture with your class. Your class. Yeah. Hello, All right. Yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. I see I'm named Dr. Victoria. What a privilege. My <laughs> name is Dimitrio Manjat. Um, I am an attorney at law from Mozambique. Um, I might be uh, the only Portuguese speaker in the room. So I uh, just want to say hi to say the Portuguese community or the Portuguese Africa is here as well. I've seen uh, former friends, brothers and sisters, uh, Madeline, uh, Cynthia, um, Patson as well, uh, with whom I've been in the Africa Arbitration Academy. It's a, such a, a great privilege for me to attend uh, this seminar and the uh, program moving on. Thank you all. All right, uh, thanks a lot, Jocelyn and Kennedy. If we don't have any more people, then we shall have to close. Mm. Can I say all right, uh, sorry. 
All right. I don't think we have any more people who would like to Can say I hi. Say something? Yes, please say something. Hi, how are you? Uh, this is uh, yes, Ainaman Saddam. I'm from uh, Uganda. I actually go to Uganda Christian University. I'm in my last year. I'm doing oil and gas as well as uh, uh, ADR. This has been a very, very wonderful discussion. Uh, it has helped me a lot. And I believe it has helped everyone here. Uh, actually, I had, I had one of my mentors discussing who is um, Mr. Patson Arenaitwe, who has been my lecturer before. So honestly, it was very glad of me and I'm so happy to have engaged with such wonderful minds. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot. I uh, would like to close our conference, but really I'm so grateful that you stayed with us for all this time because in most conferences, people just log in and go. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm also so grateful that many people signed up, although I think they couldn't make it because of the time difference or other commitments. So we shall be doing this more and more and we're happy to have you feel free to access the books, they are for free, so you don't have any excuse for not learning about the energy sector, the mining sector, international arbitration. We're always here to uh, share our knowledge with different people. Professor Demilola, are you still on? Hello, Demilola, are you on? All right, uh, I guess he's not on and this will be the end of our conference. Thank you very much and have a lovely weekend and happy Easter holidays. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.